Please be seated. Romans chapter 15. As we make our way from Genesis to Revelation on Sunday nights. The first 13 verses of chapter 15 are a continuation of all that Paul has been saying in chapter 14 as we looked at last week. And it's instruction on how to handle disputes in the body of Christ over what Paul refers to in chapter 14, verse 1, as doubtful things. And doubtful things are those issues that come up in our uh, spiritual lives and in our relationship with one another as Christians where the Bible isn't uh, completely clear in its teaching. There is no thou shalt associated with it or no thou shalt not. In other words, there might be two or three positions on a particular activity. All of them may be perfectly right with the Lord. There were two groups in that early church that the Lord was trying to wed together into uh, one body. The Jews that came from a very, very religious and very, very legalistic background for whom liberty in a relationship with the Lord was a very, very foreign thing. And when you come from that kind of a background, it takes it can take a while for that to happen where you begin to realize, wow, what I've been taught as the commandments of God, I'm discovering now to be the traditions of men. But when you've been taught that so long, you it can really take a long time to kind of walk out of it a step at a time. And so God tells those that were really strong in their liberties, listen, Don't despise people that come from that background and for whom this is going to be a long process to fully appreciate how free they are in the Lord. Not to sin, not free to sin, but free to be like Christ. And that is the definition for holiness, Jesus, but the definition for the liberties in our lives. Would Christ do that? Could he do it? Did he get bogged down on these things that bog me down or not and and testing it by his life? And then there were the Gentiles who came out of no spiritual background at all. And they came in and they were so excited over the fact that God would have anything to do with them, much less save them into a family and then identify himself with these, you know, pagan debauched sinners. And so they looked over at the the Jewish converts and their legalism, and and there was a tendency to despise, uh, you know, their details and what they got bogged down in. And God said, listen, don't do that. And And then he told the more legalistic brothers, the weaker brothers, as he calls them, and he said, now don't you judge those that have a stronger sense of the liberties that they have in Christ. In other words, don't look over there and say, if they call themselves a Christian, if they were a Christian, they'd worship on Thursdays too. You know, or they'd eat only vegetarian burritos from Baja Fresh. Or what, you know, and so they had to, and they were fighting, you know, over these issues. Can you, do you have to be a vegetarian as a Christian? Can you eat meat that was offered to an idol? And, and what day of the week is more important than any other day? And, and there's no set thing on that. that people were free to go either way. And God loved both groups of people. And he had grace for both groups of people. And, and so now he continues to instruct us on this theme so that we don't divide over these non-essentials. And Paul declares in verse 1, we then who are strong. Now notice that word we, because here is a Pharisee of the Pharisees. <laughs> Paul, the great Jewish rabbi, who has a firm grasp on the liberty that a Christian has in Jesus Christ, and he aligns himself not with the more legalistic Jewish segment, but he aligns himself with the Gentiles. He aligns himself, so to speak, with those who are strong in their liberties in the Lord. And he said, we then who are strong ought to bear, not despise, but bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. 
That, that's the whole thing he's going to talk about over and over again. In, in looking at them and whether you have them over to your house for dinner and, and all, don't, don't serve them prime rib. You may be dying for prime rib. You have it tomorrow to yourself. But don't do this to them. Put them, their spirituality, their relationship with the Lord, their, who they are as a person, above your liberties. When, when push comes to shove on that, elevate them over your liberties and, and pleasing yourself. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, that is, his spiritual welfare leading to edification. So he says, listen, don't be thinking about yourself first and foremost. You know, don't, I have liberties to do this, and, you know, you can just, you know, take it or leave it. No, you know, no not that kind of we're, But where we look and say, what, how can I behave myself as one who is strong in the liberties that, that we have in Christ? How can I behave myself with this stricter brother in a way that is good for them spiritually, their spiritual welfare? I don't stumble them. And... In fact, their contact with me leaves them edified. And that's what he said. That's more important than any liberty any of us have. And what is our example in all of this? It isn't like God is asking us to do something that's foreign to us. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. So the strong brother, he can look at things and say, you know, that's just too bad. They're going to have to get over it. And that's how you do it inside your mind, you know. I think, I think that's how it sounds in heaven anyway. And, and we can look and say, you know, and, and, and that lay that whole thing out. Why should I have to pay the price for there, you know? And then what the Lord is telling us here is no one will ever outgive Calvary. Look what he was willing to bear in our weakness. Look at what he was willing to have not only inflicted upon him physically for our spiritual well-being and for our edification, but the blasphemies that were directed to him, all of those things that were directed at him. So he's our example here. Were, were you weak when he saved you? How many, you know, hulks did we have? Just a quick show of hands when you got saved and you, you know, you're just the strongest thing. No, we we're pretty weak, weren't we? And did he come down? to our level, to meet with us on that level, because he knew, try as we might, that's, a, that's as high as we could reach. It wasn't high at all. And so what he has done for us, we can do for others. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. How patient has God been with you? He's been very patient with me. So patient, I don't want you to know how patient he's been with me. How comforting has God been to you in your weakness? Have you ever failed? Of course not. You come to Sunday evening services. Of course, we've all failed. What did the Lord do? Came up, just kicked sand right in your eyeballs, didn't he? That's not what he did. He came in and He comforted us. God has been patient with us who are strong in the liberties and all. He's been a patient God. He's been a comforting God. Not only does, as He's been described in the Scriptures, but it's been our experience. All that He was in those Gospels, He's in our life every single day. And so what He, what he has been to us, He's asking us just to be that to other people while they're growing in their liberty. And now may the God of patience and comfort that's a great title for him, isn't it? The God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another just the way Christ Jesus was, according to Christ Jesus. And so what he has been to us, what he is to us, every day he wants us to be to others. You ever get impatient with other Christians?
It, it is a rhetorical question. You don't have to shout out, I know. Isn't it funny how we can just, we know better, but we can expect general perfection from one another? I'm not talking about people just go out there and say, I'm just going to sin, you, you too bad, kind of a thing like that. But I'm talking about how Christians, they're just going along and they're growing in their relationship with the Lord. And, you know, then they mess up in that situation. They get in your face. It's not a characteristic of their life necessarily or all. And then what happens for the next ten years? Yeah, I remember that. I tell you, you think about it, huh? <laughs> you call yourself a Christian. But how patient is God with us? Every once in a while, it doesn't happen very often. Don't do it if, if, if you're tempted. But every once in a while, come, someone will come up to me and they'll say, You know, I've, I've noticed something, Damien. I've noticed that you've really grown over the years. And I look at them and I say, Not a quarter of what you've grown, Buster. <laughs> We're all going to grow. I don't want to really hear about how much I've grown or how much you've noticed. That's a private affair. So you just keep that to yourself. And what I've noticed about you, I'll keep to myself. That's one of those rules. I'm just a little weak there. You may have liberty. But we are all growing. And just to cut people slack over the fact that until we see him face to face, we're going to fall short. But God's got the patience and He's got the comfort for us and He wants that same thing to come through our lives to other people. That you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the, Lord, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's something that weak and strong can agree on. Most of the squabbling and fighting and division and all of that stuff is because we move away from the Lord and praising the Lord. And are you saved? Yeah. And am I saved? Yeah. We're going to be in heaven one day. Yeah. You're going to have a crown on that, you know, glassy sea. Yeah. Well, let's not worry about Saturday or Sunday for when we're going to worship because we're, it's not going to go anywhere with you and I. So let's talk about what we can agree on and shift it over here. Let's just praise the Lord together. And so we have so much to agree on and focus on. He says, this is something that we can do. And therefore receive one another, just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now, I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision, that is, to the Jews, for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers. And so God has come in and he has saved the Jews. He has saved, or saved the Jewish Christians. Why did he save the Jewish Christians? Because they were so wonderful and so great? No, to keep his promises from the Old Testament. But then why does he save the Gentile? That he, in verse 9, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Why does he save the Gentile, the non-Jew? To demonstrate his mercy, to demonstrate his grace in our life. In other words, there's no, none of us deserves to be saved. We're all sinners saved by grace. No one is greater than, you know, anybody else when you put both people at the base of that cross. And so nobody's better than each other. Every, none of us deserve to be saved. And yet he's done it to fulfill his promises made to the fathers for the Jews and then saving the Gentiles so that people would glorify God because he's so merciful. When you show up at work on a Monday and say, guess what happened? I got saved last night at church. Oh, no, another one bites the dust and another one's gone and another. <laughs> then they start to watch you to say, OK, is this going to be a 48 hour wonder or is is this the real deal that's happening here? And then they watch and they, then they see, knowing what you and I were, our families or whoever or whatever, realizing God is a gracious God to save people like that and to change people like that. And then just so 
they don't think Paul is pulling a rabbit out of his hat. He quotes now four verses from the Old Testament that establish one after another the Old Testament roots that God was going to call for the unity of Jew and Gentile together in the worship of the Lord. As it is written, for this reason I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you peoples. And again, Isaiah says, And there shall be a root of Jesse, and he who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him the Gentiles all hope. Now may the God of hope, and it's interesting in verse 5, the God of patience and comfort. Now he gives another title for God in verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So he calls now for the God of hope to fill us with all joy and peace in believing. In believing what? In believing that every single thing that he has said in his word concerning his salvation of us, his forgiveness of us, every promise that he's given us in his word, he's going to fulfill by the power of his Holy Spirit. And when a person understands that and believes that to be true about the word of God, when a child of God really believes that, the fruit of it is going to be joy and peace and hope. And now in verse 14, he kind of shifts gears and he says, Now I am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Now this is what Paul is dealing with. He's writing from Corinth, where we get to next week. Well, no, the week after. And he's writing from Corinth to Rome, but he's never been to Rome. Now, he knows just about everybody in Rome, as we're going to see in chapter 16, but he's never been to Rome. He doesn't have a personal relationship with the leaders of the church in Rome. But he, he writes this letter, and he's, he's giving them commandments. He's telling them, now, this is how you need to handle this, and you need to do this, and, and I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. And he's gone into kind of an exhortive mode. And we kind of get a glimpse at Paul's you know, humanness as he's, as he's closing things out here because he doesn't want them to misunderstand him. So he says, listen, I'm exhorting you and telling you these things, not because I don't think you don't know them or that you're not able to exhort one another. He said, I'm telling you these things because this is what I do. (laughs) I'm an apostle and apostles can't help doing this kind of thing. Instructing God's people, encouraging God's people, stretching God's people even into greater greatness as he gets into in verse 15. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points. He's concerned that his boldness will be misunderstood as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God. What was the grace given to Paul by God? Apostleship. Apostleship. He said, I'm, I'm writing this letter to you. It is marked by boldness only because I'm obeying God's call on my life in declaring these things to you. That I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And therefore I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus and the things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and in deed to make the Gentiles obedient. So what Paul is going to do here and is doing is he's laying out, he's laying out the fact that he's an apostle and his right to speak to them in this way. And then he's writing about the evidences, uh, the fruit of his life, that is an evidence of the fact that he is an apostle to the Gentiles. And he, and he talks about the, the fact there in verse 18, one of the evidences of the fact that he is the apostle to the Gentiles is the number of changed lives among the Gentiles. 
And all these cities that he would go into, these people are just completely steeped in paganism and idolatry and all of the sensualness of it and, and all the thing. And you can only do sin so long before you wonder, is this all there is to life? Is this what it's about? And then they come in and they hear about a God that loves them and a God that loves them as much as anybody else, but a God who is a holy God like we've talked about. A holy God? You mean I could be holy? You mean I don't have to... I don't have, this, there's an option to this life that I'm living. I've never known anybody live anything different than this. This is generational in my family, the Roman family or the Greek family or this kind of thing. And all of a sudden God comes in and says, no, there's a different way, different way to live. And they were turning in huge numbers to the Lord. And that was an evidence of Paul, the call of the Holy Spirit uh, on Paul's life to minister as the apostle to the Gentiles, obedient Gentiles. And then God confirmed his call on his life in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God so that from Jerusalem and around about to uh, Elyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And so everywhere he went in this uh, region, a region uh, covering, uh, I think, round trip, something like 1,800 miles of the whole region that he went around and, and, and sharing uh, the gospel and, and God confirming everywhere with signs and wonders the truth that he was preaching to Jew and Gentile alike. And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. And I've, I've heard that preached sometimes and that kind of thing. And, you know, Paul never built on another man's foundation. He went where the gospel had never been preached. And I think to myself, when I came to Modesto and we got the pack from the welcome wagon, it listed 130 churches already in town. I guess I missed my opportunity to be the great Apostle Paul to Modesto. Modesto had been fairly well evangelized for a mm, long time. That was God's Paul, call on Paul's life. He may take you someplace around the world in his call upon your life where no one has heard the gospel before. And thankfully, that's a smaller and smaller group. But most of us are going to minister, you know, where, where someone has already broken ground before us and that kind of... And that's great. This is just what, what God did with Paul. And what Paul is basically saying here is, you know, I didn't go in with other people or, or build on top of what somebody else had done so that when God did these great works and established these strong churches in these towns, it wasn't a thing where they'd look and say, well, was it Paul or was it so-and-so in the thing? Paul said, each of these cities I went to and alone as the apostle and leading that kind of thing, God did what he did. And in doing that, just a testimony of his call upon my life and that he has chosen to save the Gentiles and loves to save them. But as it is written, to whom he has not he was not announced, they shall see, and those who have not heard shall understand. So, you know, he's always quoting verses, always quoting verses from the Bible to substantiate what it is that he is saying. So that's kind of his vision, you know, his vision verse for going where they, nobody had ever heard before. And for this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you. Paul had evidently wanted to come to Rome and see the the church there in Rome for a long time, but he said, I've been busy planting churches all the way from Jerusalem to Halejahim. Right there, whatever the name of that city is in verse 19. He says, I've, I've been hindered from coming for that reason. But now no longer having a place in these parts. I've kind of finished. It's the, the region's been well reached. And having a great desire these many years to come to you, whenever I journey to Spain... I shall come to you. Now, Spain was a part of the Roman Empire and, as best as we know, was unevangelized at this time. So Paul's just keeping right in his pattern of wanting to go, man, where they've never heard, where they've never heard. He's an apostle. So God's, that's a pretty special thing to be an apostle. The way that God confirmed with signs and wonders and, and all that, that, that anointing and that, that kind of office. So he, he wasn't going to, he's always going to be out pushing the borders of 
of the body of Christ. And he had a desire to go to Spain. And he said, listen, whenever I, I journey to Spain, uh, I, will, I want to stop in on Rome on the way there. We have no biblical record that he, that he ever got to, to Spain. We don't know that he didn't, but we don't know that he did. For I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way uh, there by you. If first, I may enjoy your company for a while. So Paul's just saying, go ahead and get the guest bedroom uh, ready uh, because I'm planning going to Spain and want to spend some time with you and enjoy fellowship with one another and this, this kind of thing. And, and so, uh, you know, get, uh, get fresh linens uh, on everything. Now, I, I hope the linens weren't too fresh because Paul's going to run into a lot of problems in, in Jerusalem and he's going to spend... Uh, two years in imprisonment in Caesarea, and he's going to end up in Rome, but uh, it won't be a part of, of uh, kind of a missionary journey that he, ha- he had in mind. He'd go there as a Roman uh, prisoner. But, but he's, he's sharing his heart. He's talking about the future, what he wants to see happen in the future. He's a man with vision, isn't he? And so he wants to come there and enjoy their company for a while on the way. But now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints there. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. And Paul talks about this extensively in in 2 Corinthians uh, chapters 8 through 9. And as he went to the different cities, dominated by uh, Gentile population for the most part, but Jews also making up uh, the churches, and he began uh, to take a free will offering from the Gentile churches. They were prospering. There was a, a, a drought and some real difficulty in Jerusalem at that time. Also, uh, a lot of persecution against the church there and all. And so he thought, well, the one way to build a bridge between the Jewish believers and the uh, Gentile believers would be for the Gentiles to bring an offering, to just kind of uh, offer it to them, say, we love you, we care about you, your needs being met. And uh, Paul was always looking for a way to unite those two uh, portions of the church, having uh, understanding both sides better than probably any one single person in, in maybe the history of the church. For it, uh, so that's the offering that he wanted to bring. He said in verse 27, it pleased them indeed. And they, that is the Gentiles, are there, that is the Jews debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. We are debtors to the Jewish people. They have provided us by the Spirit of God with the Old Testament scriptures, virtually all the New Testament scriptures. And they have provided us with our Messiah and and so many things. And Paul just had that all, again, working to unite the the Jew and the Gentile. And whenever we take a trip to Israel and I see all the Jews and they're in the shops and they're working and they're doing all these different things. And I just look at them and I say, God, thank you so much that that you spoke your word into this world uh, virtually in its entirety through this group of people. And, uh, and I know they have faults and just everything else like every, everybody else. And I know they need to come to know the Lord just like everybody else. But I know you have brought my Savior into the world through the Jewish nation. And I'm a thankful Gentile uh, for that. And therefore, when I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, this offering, I shall go by way of you to Spain. But I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. He said, I can't wait to get there. We're going to talk about how good it is to be saved. We're going to talk about the gospel, that death, that burial, that resurrection, what it means for our lives. We're going to worship together. We're going to study his word together. He had that beautiful anticipation of being with the church there in Rome. But in the meantime, he begs them for prayer uh, for his a journey into Jerusalem. Now, I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, the love that comes from the Holy Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me. Now, he, he begs the church at Rome to pray for him. And leaders in the body of Christ need prayer. Everybody needs prayer. It would be so easy to look and say, oh, Paul, who needs to pray for him? I mean, look at him. 
Look how God's using him. And look at how, you know, what, how strong he is and how fearless he is and, and all of these things. I mean, come on, let, we can pray for other people. And Paul comes in and says, no, you, you pray for me. He says, I beg you to pray for me. You know, sometimes people, you know, people are very, very gracious. And they'll look at the Calvary Chapel here, and, and I, I have people that haven't come to the church here, and I interact with them in the community and stuff, and they're going to Costco, you know, on Sunday when they should be here. But that's another story. It's another story. And all, and they drive by, and they see all those cars parked out there on the road, you know, and, and then law enforcement directing them and the whole thing. And they say, what in the world's going on over there, you know, and that kind of thing. I say, well, I say, to me it's a testimony to three things. I say, what you don't know is what we have people do is come in and just park. There's only seven people that come to this church. They park their cars there, and they're just like the casinos do. We load them up in buses, and we get them something, uh, you know, down here at the Panda Express, give them a coffee. It takes about an hour and a half. Get them back. They get out of the way, and the next group comes in. That's what's happening here. All right, so I had a little too much caffeine this afternoon. <laughs> and I say, all I know about what the Lord is doing over there is that He's a gracious God, number one. He blesses His Word, number two. And people are praying. People are praying. That's the extent of it. And Paul looks and he says, he begs them for prayer. And it's interesting, as he, he speaks here, he said that you would strive together with me in prayers. Strive, you strive together with me in prayers to God for me. Pray for me. The word strive, it means to wrestle. You ever had somebody ask um, you to pray for them and you start to pray for them and you go, okay, this is interesting. And, and it isn't a simple little thing. You feel like you've entered into a wrestling match. And you realize whatever is going on spiritually around that person's life is very intense because to enter into intercession for this person is to enter into a, a spiritual wrestling. And I imagine that to pray for the Apostle Paul given the intensity of his ministry, who he was, God, what God was doing, to begin to intercede for him. It's like Paul said, just, I want you to pray for me, but I, what I want you to know is it will be a lot like wrestling when you start. <laughs> he said, but he, he said, I beg you to do it, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe. Now, when Paul took that offering to Jerusalem, and he'd been warned all the way along, man, they're gonna, it's going to be trouble there, Paul. He knew it. He knew that. He said, what are you doing? You're trying to give me a faint heart here? He said, I wanted to go to Jerusalem and die. It's not, it, that's not the issue. I've already counted the cost on, on all of that. But here he asked for prayer to, to the body of Christ. And he said, listen, there's, there's a group of folks there that they haven't believed yet. And I know firsthand what those folks can be like. And they can stone you at the drop of a hat. And so I ask that, that you'd pray for my physical protection in the, in the middle of that scene and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. So he's bringing this offering from the Gentiles, and, uh, but the, the church in Jerusalem, made up mostly of Jews, they're, they're, going, they're the slowest group in the early church to understand what God's doing. And they're still not that sure that God's interested in Gentiles. So Paul says, listen, when I bring this offering, would you pray that they would accept it, even though it comes from Gentiles, and that God would use it to build a bridge between these two people, and that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. And now... The God of peace, so he goes, the God of patience and comfort, verse 5, the God of hope, verse 13, and now he closes this out. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Now, now Paul is having considerable trouble, as we're going to see in a moment, uh, closing this letter. You'd think that he's just going to say, all right, in, in Jesus' name, amen, and then all through the room you hear the Bible's close. 
Paul got another chapter. And so in verse 16, he begins to greet some people there in Rome, or chapter 16. Greet some people in Rome, give them some final thoughts. He said, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church at Sencrea. And Sencrea was, was the main, uh, it was the port that fed the city of Corinth. Very, very prosperous uh, area in the ancient world. And it's interesting, uh, is, well, verse 2, that you may, here's what he asks of them for her, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and then not just receive her, but then assist her in whatever business she has need of you. And then here's the reason, for she's been a helper of many and of myself also, because she's received and she's assisted many more. And so do the same thing for her. Now what's interesting about Phoebe is she's carrying the letter. She carries the letter of the book of Romans from Corinth to Rome. The letter that has changed more lives than you and I could ever imagine, he puts in the hands of a woman. Now, you and I think nothing of it because we're men and women in the United States of America and the quality is it's getting there and that, that kind of thing. But in ancient times, a woman's testimony wasn't even accepted in a court of law. And here she's given the book of Romans to deliver to Rome. See how important it is when Paul declares, commit these things to faithful men and to faithful women. What if she wasn't faithful and she lost the letter to the Romans on the way? And when God calls us to do things for him, the importance, he doesn't explain everything, doesn't say, now listen, you've got to be careful because this is going to end up doing this and there's going to be a Protestant Reformation out over here and then and, and the whole deal. No, if he has given me, didn't, he didn't ask Phoebe to write the letter just to deliver the letter. But she needed to be faithful in that, and she was. And so Paul said, she's coming, you take good care of her. He said, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. And Priscilla and Aquila from Acts chapter 18, when Paul came into Corinth, which is where they were at that time, they were all tent makers and they took Paul in and they, they, and they all worked their trade together to support themselves there in Corinth. But now Priscilla and Aquila are where? They're in Rome. God just moving his people all over the place. Sometimes people ask, you know, and they say, well, you know, where's, uh, how do we get in the membership here? And, and we explain, well, we really don't have a formal membership here. The, the members are uh, people who come. And, and the Spirit directs people in, and He can direct people out. The Holy Spirit gets to do all that. He gets to shift His people around however much He wants to do. And He moved a lot of these people around. Paul met them in other cities and all. Now He's got them all clustered there in Rome who risked their own necks for my life. We don't know anything more about that incident than what's recorded right here. To whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that's in their house. And, if, and so uh, uh, Priscilla and Aquila had opened up their house for the church uh, there in Rome. And, uh, of course, they didn't have church buildings in, in that time or anything. Every, all the churches met in homes for the most part. And uh, so it was meeting in their house there in Rome. Greet my beloved... Uh, <laughs> Paul knew him really good. And uh, said the uh, Eponidas, who is the first fruits of Achaia to Christ... So he remembers, he says, remember to greet so-and-so. He was my first convert there. He remembers his first convert. And, and, that, and God has taken that man to be a part of the church in Rome. Greet Mary who labored, notice not just labored, but labored much for us. As we talked about this morning, I don't, I don't know if a person could be 
any person could be a harder worker than Paul. As I read the Scriptures. And when he's impressed, I mean, when he's going around and everything and, and his eye kit is caught by a saint, by how hardworking they are, man, you've, you've really got to be a hard worker. That's what he remembered about her. She labored much for us. And greet Andronicus and Junia, my uh, countrymen and fellow prisoners. We don't know where they were in prison with Paul. Remember, Paul wasn't just imprisoned in Philippi when he wrote uh, to the Corinthians. He, he said in, in, in imprisonment frequently. So he was in prison for his faith many times. And at one point in time, these brethren were there uh, in, uh, uh, in the jail. They weren't a convert of his in the jail because he says, who were of note among the apostles, well known by the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Greet uh, and, uh, Phileas, my beloved in the Lord. He, Paul just says, I love this guy. Uh, greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ. And Stachys, uh, my beloved, greet uh, Apollos, approved in Christ. So somehow this Apollos, he remembers, Paul remembers him as someone who's really went through a tough trial. And the, and the trial just proved the sincerity of their faith. Approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of... Uh, make sure? And uh, greet uh, Herodian... My countrymen, greet those who are of the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Uh, greet uh, Trephenia and Trephosha, uh, who have labored in the Lord. Now, this is interesting. Those are, so far, except for Phoebe up at the front, all these other names have been male names. And there, in, in the beginning of verse 12, those are two female names. And the interesting thing is Paul says, you greet them, they've labored in the Lord. All the way through when he's talking about the men, he says, uh, the beloved, my beloved, my beloved, you know, I, my beloved and this kind of thing. And he comes to the women and he said, give them a good handshake. And, and he has a, there's a real, he, he sets a real, um, he's very, very careful with the opposite sex. How he talks about love toward them and beloved and these kinds of things. He, he pulls back so nothing ever gets misunderstood on things. It's very, very wise. Greet the beloved, the beloved Persis, who labored much in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Uh, greet Asyncritus. <laughs> All right. Phlegon, uh, Hermas, Hermes, and the brethren who are with them. I hate, I'm so bad on names. You, I'm, you might have noticed. <laughs> Greet Philogius and uh, Julia. All right. And Nerus and his sister and Olympus and all the saints who are with them, greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. And so in, in that ancient world, still common in some parts of the world, we do handshakes. Other parts of the world kiss one cheek, then the other cheek, you know, and, uh, 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 and they do things or, you know, you greet one another. Within, in the early church, they, they greeted one another with, with a holy kiss. And so he said, greet them with the traditional uh, greeting, send our love. And then he says, now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions, those that try to ch split the body of Christ. They cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. Now, Paul, before he leaves this letter, he's a very thorough man, very thorough man. And, and what he wants to do is he wants to make sure that when he tells them to be patient with the weak, the weaker brother, he is not saying be patient with the divisive person because those are two entirely different creatures. You're patient with the weaker brother as it relates to his liberties, but the person 
who is interested in bringing division into the body of Christ, false doctrine in the body of Christ. There's not to be patience there. You're to note them in the original language. It's with orange spray paint on their forehead right here so everyone can identify them. I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you've learned. So note them. And number two, then avoid them. For those uh, who are, uh, are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. So from the very beginning, there have been these people and it exists to this day. And they come in and they see something wonderful that is happening by the Spirit of God. And they've got to make some kind of a division or some kind of a doctrinal deal that they do in order to try and work a group of people off from that body. And their whole uh, uh, motivation for doing it, he says, is their own belly, which, is, which means their own appetites. They're, they're, they're driven by their own appetites for uh, glory or for being followed by people or the money that they can get out of it and, and that kind of thing. And that always happens. You know, in this body, we're, we're actually pretty, uh, been through all the years, pretty free of this kind of stuff. But every once in a while, you know, someone will come in and all of a sudden they just start to work the fringes. And, and they'll come in and say, wow, you know, uh, you, you attend church here and everything. You must really like the Word of God. Yeah, you know, I really do. I like the Word of God and all. And uh, you're pretty serious. I can tell you're serious about your relationship with the Lord, aren't you? Yeah, you know, I try to be. I really, I really try to be. So you, you like the way they teach here and everything? Yeah, I really do. You know, I think they're, they're, that they do a pretty good job here. A, a pretty good job. But, but I don't think they really teach you meat. But, but at my house on Tuesday nights, we really get into the meat of the Word. And if you really want to get into the meat of the Word, then you come on over here and all of a sudden, whoosh, slipping off now into some other trip because of their own appetites, their own uh, selfish belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech, they decide, deceive the hearts of the simple. And so they come in, they know all the words, all the terminology, they know what you're thinking before you know what to think if you're simple. Simple. What is simple? Simple in the Scriptures. Simple in the Scriptures. As we've mentioned before, the, the statistic, 80% of all converts, so to speak, into Mormonism come from a Christian church background sometime in their life. But they remained simple in the Scriptures. They never learned the Word of God. So they're suckers for this kind of stuff that happens. They come in, divide, pull people off. For your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. So Paul is saying, you've got a reputation, church in Rome, you've got a reputation all over the world for being an obedient people. But what you've got to add to that obedience is you've got to be a discerning people also. You've got to know your Bible, identify these people as a result of it, and avoid them in your congregation. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So that's Paul's second closing. I remember one time, and uh, there was a, uh, a, 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 I was in a, a room or something, and, and someone had, uh, actually he taught an hour and 45 minutes. <laughs> But I mean, who was counting? <laughs> and by the time he said now, he got toward the end of things and he said, now for my third closing. Nobody laughed. So I try to avoid that. But Paul here, he, he keeps closing by the Spirit of God. He's got a few more things that he wants to say. So he, he's just eager to bless. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So be it. That's the truth. And then he said, Timothy, my fellow worker, and Lucius, Jason, uh, Sosipater, my uh, countrymen, they greet you. So Paul has been greeting from Corinth all of his friends. Look how many people he knew by first name and experience in the church in Rome. It's a very small world in the body of Christ, isn't it? And then here now he is uh, taking and giving the greetings of who he's with there in, in Corinth. And, and they're sending their greetings now to Rome. And I... Uh, 
Tertius, who wrote this epistle, greet you in the Lord. And so he was the, he was the secretary. Paul quoted the, uh, the, uh, dictated it to him, and he wrote it, so he sends his greeting. Gaius, Paul said, my host, and the host of the whole church. This is where Paul was staying there in Corinth. We're going to read about Gaius when we go into, uh, into 1 Corinthians, where he said, listen, I, 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 apart from Crispus and Gaius, I, I don't know who else I baptized in Corinth. So Gaius was the house that he was staying in. The church was uh, meeting there in the home of Gaius. And uh, the host of the whole church they, greets you. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, so high officials affected for the Lord, greets you. And Quartus, a brother, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Then now he closes it with his blessing upon them. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. They got some things they're working through. A lot of, God's bringing a lot of very different people together into this new thing called the body of Christ. And he said, listen, you don't sweat it. Just do what, I, what God has spoken uh, through me here to do and all. God's going to establish you. He's going to take care of you. And he did. According to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since uh, the world began. And that mystery is uh, not that God would save Jews. It wasn't that God would save Gentiles. It was that he would save them both and make them one body. That was the mystery that um, was uh, revealed uh, in the body of Christ in this New Testament era. But now, uh, m- but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. To God alone wise, as the only wise one in the whole world, to God alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. And the word amen means that's the truth. So be it. And so he praises the Lord as he closes that epistle. It's been about four months on Sunday night in the book of Romans. Again, all the way back there in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. What we've been through as we've gone through is those first three chapters, God just describing the darkness of man's heart apart from God, our need for the gospel. Then salvation, just simple faith, simple faith, simple faith. All right, but I'm saved, but I don't want to live the old life that I used to live. And he addressed that. And then trying to live it in our own strength. And then he talks about the power of the Spirit. And all that we've been through as we've gone through this great epistle of, uh, of Paul to the Romans. What a, a beautiful, beautiful letter. And next time, uh, Ken Ham will be here, of course, next week. And uh, then the following Sunday night, Lord willing, we'll head into the book of 1 Corinthians. So if the worship team would come forward, and we'll close out with some worship tonight as our hearts are once again directed to the Lord in worship.